Welcome to Murder Mile, a true crime podcast, an audio guided walk featuring many of London's untold, unsolved, and long forgotten murders, all set within and beyond the West End. Today's episode is about Tudor Simeonov, a good moral man who earned an honest wage as a bouncer. But when his colleagues came under attack from a group of selfish thugs, the new life he had hoped for was destroyed in the blink of an eye. Murder Mile is researched using authentic sources. It contains moments of satire, shock and grisly details. And as a dramatization of the real events, it may also feature loud and realistic sounds. So that, no matter where you listen to this podcast, you'll feel like you're actually there. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 143, The Last Defense of Tudor Simeonov. Today, I'm standing in Park Lane, W1, two streets west of the massacre of flight LL016, two streets southeast of the royal delusion of Godratola Barani, and a few hundred yards east of the unforgivable death of Gladys Wilson, coming soon to Murder Mile. Sandwiched between Hyde Park and Mayfair, Park Lane is supposedly one of London's most desirable areas, where only the super wealthy can afford to live. With millionaires' pads given an unrestricted view over the city, they are surrounded by luxury car showrooms like Aston Martin, Barabbas and BMW, and five-star hotels like Hilton, Grosvenor House and the Dorchester. But it's not the kind of place where you go, ooh look, stylish, or ooh look, fashionable, as the wealthy tend to have more money than taste. Park Lane is little more than a six-lane carriageway, chock full of the choking fumes of trucks. It's grim, it's dirty, and it's foul. Of course, here you will always see a preening hyperponce failing to look so smug as his super-fast penis extension overheats in the traffic and old money oil magnates with facelifts so fierce you'll wonder if the wind tunnel is a super trendy new bar. But mostly you'll just see fakers. Vacuous talent vacuums, unable to utter a single syllable except, oh my god, owing to the grossly dysmorphic S shape that they've twisted their figures into. With lips, bum and boobs out, but everything else sucked in like they're learning to breathe through their bum holes. At 80 Park Lane sits a vague brown door with frosted glass and potted plants on both sides. Squished between a 24-hour garage, a mini dealership and an eight-story mansion block above, it looks like the back door to a loading bay, but it's not. This is the entrance to a stylish £12.5 million townhouse with glass floors, fine art and a first floor roof terrace. All of which you can rent out for £16,000 a month. On New Year's Eve 2018, 80 Park Lane had been rented out for an exclusive party. A ticket only event for social climbers the slightly sleazy and attention seekers whose only life goal is to be seen as it. The night was debauched, but to ensure everyone's safety, they hired good bouncers. One was Tudor Simeonov. It was his first night at this job, but having been there barely two hours, it was also his last night alive. as it was here on New Year's Day in 2019 that Tudor was killed simply 
for doing his job. Why do bad things always happen to good people? Tudor Semyonov was someone who deserved a chance to live his dream of a good life in a new land with the woman he loved. But sadly, it was not to be. When a person dies so tragically, it's easy to dismiss the grieving words of their loved ones as generic platitudes which could be about anyone. He was a good man. He had a big heart. He had a bright future ahead. Everybody loved him. He died too young. But in Tudor's case, it was all true. Born and raised in the Romanian capital of Bucharest, the mid to late 80s was a turbulent time as Romania staggered from Soviet occupation to the collapse of communism from the oppressive austerity under dictator Nicolae Ceausescu to revolution, to his execution and to a country rebuilt. Times were hard, but there was no great mystery as to why good people raise good children. It's how they're brought up, as even against such tragedy and sacrifice, against all odds, good people will emerge. Blessed with loving parents, he was instilled from an early age with Christian values, decency, strength, kindness, and his overriding value that he would always put the needs of others before himself. Being tall and clean cut, he was handsome but never vain, as he always prided himself in his neatness. Being well built, as a big guy who could handle himself, to some, he may have appeared a little fearsome, but his physique belied his true self. As a competitive rower, Tudor was a successful part of a sculling crew who hoped, one day, to row for his country at the Olympics. Political turmoil aside, his life was tinged with sadness, as in his early 20s, his dad had died. He could have gone off the rails, he could have turned to drink or drugs, and he could have given up on his dreams. But he didn't. In fact, he never let his stresses show, as no matter what life hurled at him, through it all, he would always smile. But when his mum died, he lost it all. She was his world, but now he was alone. He could have given up, but being raised right, he found the strength to succeed. And then he found love. In 2015, 30-year-old Tudor met 20-year-old Madalina Angel. And the two became one, just as it was meant to be. As if their fate was already written, they got engaged with plans to marry and to start a family. But as Romania no longer held the right opportunities for this future Olympic athlete, keen to start a new life in a new country with a bright future ahead, Tudor and Madalina moved to England. In October 2018, they caught a flight from Bucharest to Heathrow. The transition would be relatively easy as their friends already lived in London. They would rent a small flat, Madalina would do her master's degree, and working as a part-time bouncer by night, Tudor could focus on his rowing training by day. Still in their seats, having landed, they uploaded a photo online. It's simple, but the photo showed a young couple beaming with excitement at the start of a beautiful adventure together. The caption simply reads, Goodbye, Romania. Tudor and Madalina had their whole lives ahead of them. But it would only last ten weeks.
2018 had been a testing year. As Prime Minister Theresa May narrowly won a vote of no confidence, while her grinning lapdogs poised behind her with blades to attack, the Brexit withdrawal agreement was clinging on like an unflushable turd. An unemployed turbo douche had left thousands of people stranded, with flights disrupted, by blocking airliners with a drone. And the media retailer HMV went bust, which was a nightmare for people like me, who still use DVD. By the New Year's Eve of 2018, tensions were high, stresses needed to be uncorked, and the people wanted to party. Every Londoner has their own way of booting out the old year and ringing in the new. Some stay at home, some go to bed, some go clubbing, and others shiver on a bitterly cold bridge, going ooh and ah as chemicals explode. But that year, a very exclusive party was being hosted by Fast Eddie. Lord Fast Eddie Davenport was born Edward Ormus Charrington Davenport in a very affluent part of Kensington in 1966. He was privately educated and he came from money, but he was not a lord. Like so many poshos born with privilege but no purpose, he flitted between money-making schemes like a little boy torn between toys. Therefore, Several sources list his occupation as property developer, socialite, and convicted fraudster. In the mid-1980s, he came to public attention as the co-organizer of the Gatecrasher Balls, a series of opulent, debauched parties for the spoiled sprogs of wealthy wastrels and tax dodgers, which he defined as a night of unbridled lust among upper-class Lolitas and public school Lotharios. Yuck! It was said to have made over a million pounds a year, but being convicted of tax evasion and fraud in 1990, 2005 and 2008, he was imprisoned for seven years and eight months, only to be released after three. In July 2010, at 33 Portland Place, an historic townhouse which he had controversially acquired from the Sierra Leone government during a civil war. He hosted a sex and booze fueled bash for young aristocrats. In typical Fast Eddie fashion, although every guest was treated to free-flowing champagne, trays of cocaine, and a small pool filled with a thousand liters of cognac, the party was unlicensed. It didn't have an alcohol or entertainment permit, and he was later charged with a noise breachment order. Lord Fast Eddie Davenport would never learn his lessons, and the New Year's Eve of 2018 would be no different. On the night of Monday the 31st of December 2018, Fast Eddie was hosting another boozy sex party for the affluent, the desperate and the debauched. Advertised in only very select groups, with tables priced at £2,000 a pop, this party was for the so-called cream of society, not the plebs or the hoi polloi. As a stylish three-storey townhouse, 80 Park Lane wasn't owned by Fast Eddie, but he had hired it. Not that the owners knew what he was using it for. With a club DJ pumping out tunes, waitresses serving chilled champagne, and complimentary lines of nose candy for the kind of assholes who really don't need chemical help to become more arrogant. As outside, BMWs, Porsches, and even a Lamborghini were parked. Advertised as the ultimate New Year's Eve after party, it opened at 2 a.m. and it closed at 6 a.m. But there was no denying what kind of party this was. 
Witnesses described it as wild, crazy. One even said, whatever you wanted, it was available. As with flanks of scantily clad ladies, dressed in lingerie, corsets, high heels, and lots of flesh on show, ushered in through the vague brown door, it was unashamedly a sex-themed party, and very possibly an orgy. And although it looked like a well-organized do, being ran by Fast Eddie, small details were overlooked. Like informing the owners, adhering to noise abatement rules, applying for an alcohol and entertainment permit. And as this was an unlicensed event, the bouncers weren't provided with stab-proof vests. For Tudor and his fiancée Madalena, this was their first New Year's Eve in the UK. So it was significant, as it marked not only a break with the sadness of his past, but the start of a bright future ahead. That evening, they kissed, they hugged, and they made resolutions as fireworks exploded across the city. At around 2 a.m., Dressed in a crisp white shirt, a neat black suit, and an ID around his neck, Tudor left home. He wasn't meant to work that night, but to help a friend out, he was covering his shift. At 3.41 a.m., CCTV caught Tudor crossing the SO garage and entering 80 Park Lane. His shift would be easy, as with the party half-finished, few new guests would actually turn up. And besides, his job was to monitor the party guests, and not the door. It started as a pretty ordinary night for several friends from northwest London. At 11pm, Osama Hamad, Noor Hamada and Shema Lamrani traveled in a black Audi from North Holt to Kingsbury, where they picked up Adam Khalili. They headed to Harlston for Adam al Shalakani, and joined by Haroon Akram, the group saw in the new year at Akram, a bar and nightclub in Clapham, until the club closed. Keen to keep partying, at 4.30 a.m. they headed to Mayfair, where it was said that an after-hours party was happening. The trip was pointless, which anyone with any common sense would have known. As they didn't have tickets, they hadn't enough money, they weren't pals with Fast Eddie, and as a seedy sex party for affluent socialites, this ragtag group of youths wearing jeans, t-shirts and trainers didn't fit the bill. 21-year-old Adam Khalili was unemployed and subject to a curfew order. His nose was bulbous, his beard was scruffy, and the tops of his ears were pointy. 26-year-old Haroon Akram, of no fixed abode, was fat with fuzzy hair, and he waddled like a duck. 24-year-old Noor Hamada, a barber from Wembley, had a wonky eye. And although they all acted like they were badass, in truth, they were little more than immature and pathetic. But as it was 26-year-old Osama Hamad's birthday, they were determined to celebrate in style. Although, quite why Osama decided he needed to carry an 8-inch knife to a party is still a mystery. At 5.10am, the black Audi pulled up at the top end of Mount Street, just to the side of the Esso garage. It didn't bother them that their car was blocking traffic. It didn't bother one of the passengers that he had left the rear door open. And it didn't bother them, as they walked through the garage forecourt, that Adam pulled over a bin, scattering litter. As he toked on his ciggy, with a look on his face which declared to the world, Wow, look at me, I am great. As Haroon followed behind, strutting like he'd got piles. But the details of what happened that night 
are a little sketchy. Being dark, noisy, and chaotic, with 80 Park Lane just a few feet away, but out of frame from the forecourt's cameras. What follows is based on witness statements, court records, and several badly shot pieces of grainy footage from two mobile phones. Exit in the forecourt. The group approached the vague brown door and rang the doorbell. As part of protocol, a bouncer peeped through the spy hole and popped the door open a crack. Yes? He barked as Fast Eddie hid behind his guard's towering bulk. Milling about like school kids, trying to act old enough to buy booze, the group of seven lads and two girls declared, We're here to party. But not being rich, famous, on the guest list, or corseted like a high-class pervert who had recently raided a branch of Van Summers, they were denied entry. To anyone else, no would have meant no. But growing impatient, perhaps at their inability to impress the girls they were with, the boys demanded to be let into the party, less than one hour before it shut. Again, the answer was no, as the bouncer ushered them out. But before the door was firmly shut, one of the gang dashed in, knocked over a vase and fled. It may seem pretty petty that a grown man would act so petulantly. But with the door now wide open, the group stormed in and security lost control. In the small stylish hallway, fists flew, glass smashed, and another vase was hurled as this gang of selfish mindless yobs began fighting with security. As if, having broken in and caused havoc, they would instantly be invited to stay. But then again, some people are incapable of thinking about anyone else but themselves. And as this melee erupted, it is alleged that Fast Eddie dashed out of the back door. It was then that a knife was pulled and a waitress was slashed. Trained to protect, but with no stab vests nor weapons to defend themselves, just their hands. The bouncers forced these men out of the hallway and onto the pavement. And yet still, this pathetic little gang of angry little turds fought on, kicking and punching, unable to back down like anyone with half a brain. Outside, the fight escalated growing ever more chaotic as a sea of unlit faces screamed. Flailing limbs impacted with fast smacks. Bystanders were pushed. And with the knife out, a bouncer was stabbed. The guests were protected. But with the door shut, the fight stayed outside. And although the police were on their way, stuck dealing with drunks and idiots, they wouldn't be here for several minutes. At one point, the doorman Atu Nagoy found himself circled by Haroon, Noor, Osama and Adam. Atu's colleagues, Kamil Okpara and Hassam Ali, tried to restrain them, but a violent scuffle ensued as the group bounced off walls, doors and the car showroom window. In the chaos, Shema pushed Osama away, shouting, No, Sama, no! But at times, it was impossible to tell who was fighting who. And as Atu pushed Adam over the bonnet of a grey Lamborghini, in the struggle, Atu was stabbed. Inside the party, someone ran in, screaming, there's a fight upstairs! Someone's been stabbed! Some of the lingerie-clad patrons panicked. Some hid, and some fled. But most didn't care, as it didn't concern them. 
But for Tudor, this wasn't just a job. This was his purpose. At 5:31 a.m., turning on his heels, Tudor dashed up the glass staircase. In the small hallway, he spotted everything he needed to know about what had just occurred. Smashed glass, a broken vase, a splintered door, and the blood of a slashed waitress spattered up the wall and the floor. As outside, he heard screams. At 5:32 a.m., Tudor exited the door of 80 Park Lane. His buddies were outmanned. It was nine against three with two injured. As a baying crowd swelled, jeering at the fun as a fight unfurled. And with phones out, not one of them decided to call for help. Instead, they decided to film it, giggling like morons, and dreaming. About getting likes. Having assessed the scene, Tudor tried to calm everyone down, but the gang were riled up. Doing his best to defend his friends, Tudor was struck with several blows from different assailants. To protect himself, he fought back, and as a professional rower whose training included boxing. He valiantly took on any attacker who came at him, or those around him. But fueled by petulance, in the middle of the pavement, Osama Hamid stormed towards him, a knife balled up in his right hand. It was then that the phone footage cut out. Police and paramedics arrived a few minutes later. At the scene, five members of staff, Atu Nagoy, Kamil Okpara, Hassan Ali, Mark McKinley, and Yang Ki, the waitress, were all treated for knife wounds, and all would go on to make a good recovery. Tudor had been outside for barely thirty seconds, but having been stabbed in the chest. With the knife having pierced his heart, he staggered back into 80 Park Lane, and in a red-lit bathroom, he collapsed. Levoy Rose, the club's promoter, administered first aid there and then, as blood pumped through Tudor's white shirt. He later said, "I saw him bleeding. His suit was covered. Blood was coming out of his chest." I grabbed a towel and held the wound. He never said a word to me. I think he was in shock. But as he got paler and quieter, he only survived for about a minute. He lay there, his eyes open, staring up at me. Thirty-three-year-old Tudor Simeonov died at 5:34 a.m., and he was pronounced dead at 6:05 a.m. Like cowards, most of the gang fled and went into hiding, but all would ultimately be arrested. Adam El Shalakani was caught the next day. Ahmed Munajad on the 22nd, Harun Akram on the 28th, Adam Khalili on the 29th, having tried to escape by jumping out of a window, and Osama Hamid, who had inflicted the fatal blow, alongside Nor Hamada, fled to Morocco. But the pair were later arrested on their return. Tried at the Old Bailey on the 23rd of April 2019, as they had all acted as a group. And encouraged each other, they were charged under the law of joint enterprise, making them equally culpable for their crimes. Which is why many pleaded guilty to the lesser charges of violent disorder and manslaughter. Excepting that the attack wasn't premeditated. On the 25th of March, Judge Anthony Leonard QC sentenced Adam Khalili to 11 years, Harum Akram to six years and nine months. 
Ahmed Munajid to two years, Adam El Shalakani was cleared of violent disorder, and Shema Lamrani was acquitted of perverting the course of justice by disposing of the knife. But unable to prove if Osama Hamada had inflicted that fatal blow, as the footage had cut out and the knife had mysteriously vanished, Osama was sentenced to just seven years for manslaughter and three years for violent disorder. Tudor and his fiancée Madalina had been in Britain for just ten weeks. But now, their dreams had been smashed by a single selfish act. As she would state in court, he was the kindest person I knew, and by losing him, I have lost everything. Marriage, children, Olympic hopes, and the promise of a new life. But then again, why do bad things always happen to good people? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for listening to Murder Mile. As always, a non-compulsory waffle session with added nonsense, as well as a quiz, some extra details about the case, and other such twaddle, will follow after the break. A big thank you to my new Patreon supporters, who are Nick Hammerling, Vicky Ferrace, Anne Russell, Jade Daniels, Matt Kine, and Jennifer Collier. I thank you all. May the God of Chocolate Buttons rain down sweet treats upon you, and that not a single one of these chalky treats will contain a calorie. Yuck. Murder Mile was researched, written and performed by myself, with the main musical themes written and performed by Eric Stein and John Books of Cult With No Name. Thank you for listening, and sleep well. go folks there we go Whoa. how are we all are we all good how is everyone oh welcome to extra mile sorry i should have said that welcome to extra mile because this will be for people who don't know about extra mile even though they may have not listened to that last bit i just did they may not know what this is this is extra mile it's the unedited unscripted bit it's not essential it's just a bit of fun people seem to like it so i do it i make a cup of tea we talk about cake I uh, waffle about life and shit, and then we go into some extra details and we do a quiz, which is a bit of fun, of which in the quiz I answer, I ask 10 questions, some of which I may balls up. I, I've been good the last couple of weeks. Well done, Michael. He hasn't balls up as much as you normally do. Uh, and then uh, uh, there's quiz questions. I do 10. Uh, most people get two or three right. I don't blame you because a lot of them are quite hard. Not essential to listen to this bit, so if you don't want to, you don't have to. Oh, how are we all? We are good. We are well. Is everyone staying healthy and well and happy? That's important, isn't it? Staying well and half happy. Happy? Yeah, fuck it. Let's just say it. Happy. Happy. That's a new word. I've created it. Uh, let, we'll all use it from now on. Uh, what does it mean? It means uh, happy and healthy. That's a good one, isn't it? Well done. Oh, I've created something. Uh, so, um, oh, should I go and put on it? Let's do a tea. Let's do a tea. I've just moved away the microphone. I'm going to open up windows and doors. Because it's, it's afternoon, it's not morning. Uh, I was going to record this tomorrow afternoon, but I decided not to. Um, only because... Uh, I'm going to have to close over a part of a door, because I've got my door open and now my neighbour's looking into my boat and he's thinking, why is that man talking to himself? Uh, let me just pop on a cup of tea. Whoa. Didn't put any water in. Michael, you're an idiot. Uh, do I really want a cup of tea? I don't know. Oh, well, maybe I'll do a herbally tea. Let's do a herbally tea. Oops. Yeah, that's on. Good. Hang on. Herbally tea. Going to be a peppermint. A peppermint. Right. Yeah, look, coming back. As you've noticed over the last couple of weeks, I've been bumping up the volume on this bit. So hopefully this you can hear this a little bit more. Ah, uh, what's going on? What's going on in my little world? Not much. It's the same as everyone, isn't it? It's kind of you, you when you have a conversation with people, you're like, oh, what you're, you, you forget whether you've had already had that conversation with someone. So you talk like you get on the phone to family and people, and you're there going, 
oh, should we talk about this? Did we do this last week? And keep having the same conversations because nothing's new anymore. It's it's weird, isn't it? And when, but it's nice when you you do get to have a little moment. You go, ooh, ooh, I'm doing something different for a change. That's exciting. Uh, what's happening here? Not much. I've moved on. Not not moved on spiritually or emotionally or, or in maturity stakes, of course. Uh, just moved the boat a little bit, somewhere a little bit quietish. So I'm not opposite the golf course anymore, so I can't grumble about the golf course. Rrr, grumble, grumble. Uh, I just got to have a little grumble. What's life without having a grumble? Uh, now I'm near a park full of kids. Yay! We all love kids, don't we? Uh, not that way. Uh, little bastards. Oh, I don't like kids. Just not really a fan of that. Not really a fan of kids. Oh, they, they, they cry and they crap. I don't see the point in them. I'm going to be one of these people who's never going to have kids. I've told Eva that. I've told Eva we're not going to have kids. She's fine with that. She's uh, oh, kids will just mess up the place for her. You know, uh, you know, that means more work for me, more cleaning for me to do. So yeah, she at least she's appreciating how hard I work as a as a personal slave. Um, what else is going on? Oh, so uh, this is uh this will probably probably not come out for another week or so so uh episode 141 annie sutton and the stalker within um uh, had a little bit of a problem with that i pushed it out on the thursday as you do every thursday morning so if you at automatically got it downloaded that was all good you would have got it and received it but itunes have a tendency to be a bit dickish sometimes so the episode went out and then within a couple of hours they retracted it and deleted it so then I had to go and sort that out, but the problem is iTunes is not like a regular. You know, they don't like they don't like you being able to deal with a human being. They like blip blop blip blop blip blop one one two one 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 zero blip blop blip blop. They, they like you to deal with algorithm rhythms and shit, and you don't get to you want to deal with a human being. Uh, so I spoke to Acast, and they they were like, "Well, everything's good at our end. Your RSS feed is good." And I was like, "Yeah, the episode was there, but it's not there anymore." And I don't know why. And they were like, "Well, it should be there." And I couldn't find anyone at iTunes. I couldn't find a real human being, and it was taking days, and it was dragging on, and everyone was going, "Oh, where's this episode?" And I was like, "I don't know where the bloody episode is. It should be there, but it's not." And there's nothing wrong with it, and I don't know what's going on, and I can't find a human being. And then finally, uh, I managed to get in touch with a real human being, and it was weird within a couple of minutes i was like boop there you go episode 141 annie sutton and the stalker was in with back on itunes thank god for that so uh it's so it's now sorted so hopefully some of you have sorry about that some of you will have got your episode about six days late which is really annoying for me as well because that's that's extra downloads that people won't have seen so if you haven't heard it already go back have a listen to it it's a very good one uh, good night daddy you get to do that which is good fun uh what else is going on i'm still on my diet ish still trying to do well ish trying, trying to stay off carbs trying to stay off wheat most what well, you know you know what's like white bread and shit like that uh pasta i don't really eat pasta anyway i find pasta really dull i probably mentioned this before i really just oh pizza pasta oh it's just the same it's the same uh, I hate to be Italian. It's just the same shit every time. Mediterranean foods I love. I love all the mezes and stuff like that. Do you know, I love pickles and, and you know, olives and uh, all that. And, you know, chopping up all your vegetables. And, oh, it's very nice. I just don't like this. I don't like sauces. So that's not too much of a problem. Um, hence, no cake today. I haven't got a cake. Although yesterday, mm, I might have broken a little bit yesterday. I had, a, uh, I had a, an egg custard tart. Uh, and then I went into Wenzel's because there's one down the road and I bought a, a, a sandwich and a, a, a Diet Coke. Uh, I'm on pop, but just the horrible chemically stuff, not the fattening stuff. So I'll probably die of some weird kind of brain thingy because of all the Diet Coke I've had. Uh, and then with that, I was like, oh, wh what treat do you get with the sandwich? Because it was a meal deal and they... Uh, I said, uh, can I get a Belgian bun? And then what's the deal with this? And they went, oh, no, you can get the Belgian bun with it. And I was like, oh, bollocks. Well, I have a donut as well. So I had a donut and then I had the Belgian bun, which is good. So the Belgian bun went on to uh, Cake of the Week for Patreon. So uh, if you're a Patreon subscriber, you will get that soon. Weirdly, it doesn't look as nice online, weirdly, but it tasted really good. What else is going on? Uh, Eye's situation is still uh, ongoing. I'm still half blind, uh, but I'm getting used to it now. I think, as my specialist said, it was like your eyes are going to have to readjust and they're going to refine their shape because these are brand new lenses. So my eyes are getting used to it. So I'm going to have to I'm going to have to put up with being half blind in one eye. 
uh, and the other eye a little bit under par. But I don't seem to be getting headaches, which is a good thing. So uh, let's do some questions uh, for the quiz. Of course, questions for a quiz. What else would you do in a quiz, you idiot, Michael? Uh, so I hope you're all ready. Uh, don't forget, I will mess some of these up, as I always do. Uh, actually, I've been not too bad the last couple of weeks. I've been all right. So let's give them a go. Question number one, ladies and gentlemen. <sighs> what sport did Tudor do professionally? If you look at the details, you will see that uh, uh, his name is... Uh, in the UK, we would say Tudor, because uh, it's T-U-D-O-R. But I deliberately... I always double-check everything before I put it out, because I hate mispronouncing things. And his girlfriend, or his fiance pronounces it Tudor. So I've pronounced it Tudor, as opposed to Tudor, which is uh, what many people have done. Uh, big mistake. Uh, that's not the question. Michael, go back. Question number one. What sport did Tudor do professionally? That was the question. <sighs> question number two. What was the name of Fast Eddie's first project? What was the big one that was mentioned at the start? You can either go for the name or you can just say what it is. Whatever's good for you. Uh, question three. Which Romanian city did Tudor and his fiancé fly from? I just said fiancé. I wish I hadn't said that. Fiancé. That's better. Which Romanian city did Tudor and his fiancé fly from? This is really weird having these lenses in because ever since I had the rat on the boat, which was on my boat for about half an hour until I got rid of it, uh, I've I have worries about seeing rats and mice everywhere. But because these new lenses are really weird and I'm adjusting to the shape of them and the fact that you get reflections in different places. When I'm looking ahead, I get it, it looks like there's things running around the sides of my eyes and I'm getting a lot of dark objects flitting around, which I'm going to get used to at some point. But at the moment, my brain still says that they're mice. It's not mice. I haven't got any mice. Uh, but... You never know. Question four. That wasn't a question. Question four. What was in the pond at the party at 30 Portland Place? And for a bonus question, this isn't in the episode. Uh, I didn't know this, but I just found out. Uh, let's see if you know. Which famous uh, scene was filmed from a recent film at 30 Portland Place? You can have that one for free. That will give you five bonus points if you can work out what was filmed at 30 Portland Place. Uh, but the question was, what was in the pond at the party at 30? 33 Portland Place, sorry. Right. Uh, Michael, you're all over the shop. Five. How much does it cost to rent 80 Park Lane per month? Yep. Uh, that is that is basically uh, what Eva gives me as a salary for every five years, if that helps uh, you work it out. Question six. What time did the party start and fin and what time was it meant to finish? So what time did the party start and what time was it meant to finish? Uh, question seven. What make of petrol station was next door to 80 Park Lane? Question eight. What was smashed inside the hallway by one of the group? Question nine. What was Fast Eddie holding when the attack happened? Probably the bouncer's hand, I'm guessing. Question 10. What type of car did Atu, the doorman, throw one of the gang over? Right, let's... Uh, so hopefully uh, I'll remember to do the answer to the questions, unless I forget. I guess have a quick slurp of a... Ah, peppermint tea, that's good. That really good for uh, peppermint tea, good for headaches. We're starting to get one at the moment. Right, let's just do some details that didn't make it into the episode. As always, as you as you know, uh, sometimes there's things that you just can't get to in an episode, and sometimes it's not worth dragging it out and making the episode a little bit boring. So, so that's hence why extra mile comes in useful. Um, as mentioned in the episode, there was a little bit of trouble previously uh, to two door turning up and before the attack so about 3 a.m the manager of the petrol station next door the brand of which i won't mention uh he he had actually called the police um 
there had been a fight going on in the forecourt. A group of men and women in their 20s who were dressed in Gucci and designer labels were fighting amongst themselves and threatening customers. Police were called. Uh, They also called the council who sent down an official uh, and someone there got stabbed. Um, so, but this wasn't the group who would turn up later on. It just kind of shows that, you know, around that time, there were a lot of riffraff kind of in the area and idiots carrying knives. <sighs> People and knives just grow up, learn to learn, learn to communicate. You don't need a knife if you can communicate. Uh, I, so let's dive into some extra things we already kind of covered the the fight itself is a little bit hard to explain this took me weeks of going through all the different documentation because all the all the documents that are out there are quite vague because i don't think everyone really knows what was going on so i spent months going through all the different descriptions and watching i've got some uh video that was released by the police there were two different cctv ca- uh not CCTV, uh, video cameras from mobiles that were used at that point. So I've kind of tried to compare them. And where people have been confirmed that this is them, I've used that information. But where it hasn't, I've deliberately kept it vague. Because I can't go saying that one person did this when clearly they didn't. Um, so after Tudor had been stabbed, he was just stabbed once in the chest. Uh, club promoter Leroy Rose, who was 25. Uh, his, th- these are his words. I used part of it in here. He said, uh, I saw him coming back inside. He was in a suit and it was covered in blood. He didn't have a protective vest or anything important as mentioned earlier on in the episode i saw blood coming from his chest i pulled him into the back and grabbed a towel and held uh, the wound the the bathroom itself was there's several on the kind of that floor they look very nice they're ornate they have different lighting but at that point uh to, to make it kind of uh, erotic and uh, the, the, the lights were in red so it, it probably made his job a little bit harder but uh he said uh, he never said a word he was in shock he only survived for a minute uh, he'd been stabbed in the middle of the chest. Um, a police uh, body worn footage later showed uh, him being treated by uh, Adam L. Shalakani. Sh- I had difficulty saying that during that, so I didn't put that in the episode. But Adam did was one of the people who was trying to help uh, Tudor at the point having been stabbed. Uh, and, but unfortunately, as mentioned, Tudor was. Uh, uh he died literally after a minute the paramedics arrived there was nothing they could do um and he was pronounced dead at 605 post-mortem examination said the cause of death was a single stab wound to the chest uh it matched the knife that of what they could see uh what else are we gonna do uh murder weapon so this didn't i i briefly mentioned this in the episode but it was kind of it wasn't right to put it in at that point. So Shema Lamarani, 26. Uh, I think she was Adam's, uh, Adam Adam L. Shalakani's girlfriend at the time. So she was with the group. She was one of the girls who was with the group around the time. Uh, when it went to court, she denied perverting the course of justice after allegedly disposing of the murder weapon, i.e. the knife. Um uh, jurors heard that uh, Lamrani can be seen moving over near to Ulford Street, which is uh, one street south behind the uh, the 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 the. Um, is this a question? Yeah, sod it. Uh, the mini uh, car showroom. I don't think it was a question I was going to put in. Uh, where there were several large bins. Um, it is said that she disposed of the knife in one of those bins. Now, the problem was uh, those bins, because it was uh, night time, obviously you got the bin men kind of out emptying all the bins by that point. And apparently those bins were emptied before a police cordon had been put in place in that area. Because obviously you got the police cordon around where the attack is happening. But no one's really thinking about the wider area at that point. Uh, uh, but she was found not guilty in court, i.e. there was not enough evidence um, w- w- when you actually look at the scene itself it's like around the car park I, I worked in a car park years ago car park uh, a-, a garage forecourt and there was 15 cameras in there like in the forecourt but none outside and actually there was one 
camera which was out in the uh the uh, the car wash out back but it never worked so all the druggies who were in the area knew that if they wanted to go anywhere to cause trouble they could just go into the car wash it didn't work anyway and the cameras didn't work so uh also we had a ship boss as well and uh we realized that the bulk of the cameras were focused on us and then i realized that the uh that the manager who was a complete twat um he uh he compiled a little video of all the all the mistakes that we'd made and then and then even worse this was even worse someone so he he was sent uh a, a brochure on becoming a good manager and in front of us he looked at it crumpled it up threw it in the bed and went oh i don't need that we were like you twat he'd been given the, the petrol station from by his dad as a 20 year a 21 year old birthday present the 20 a birthday present for his 21st birthday that's better it sounded like it was an old present anyway uh so uh shema lamrani um uh uh, it is the crown's case that she took the knife that she had uh, had seen being used from mr hamid so that's osama hamid and then she disposed of it in one of the bins on Alford street before it could be found uh unfortunately they they couldn't prove that in court so she was found not not guilty um didn't go into these details in the case but uh, a lot of the guys fleed afterwards not all of them but some of them did so osama hamid he was the one who did the stamid, stabbing and nor hamadi he was the one who uh, uh i believe he was the one who was he the one who tipped over the bin i can't remember uh anyway uh they fled the country the next day they got on a ferry to calais uh, and by the 2nd of January, they'd arrived in Paris. From there, they went to Barcelona before flying to Morocco in North Africa. And they ended up in uh, Rabat, which is the capital. Uh, it was there that Nor Hamadi received a call from his mother to say the police had contacted her explaining. And he explained to her that he was not the knife man. Um, he said uh, he was staying with Osama for three or four days, four or five days maximum. He was going out uh a uh, summer was going out but he said that he was not in the mood for going out uh but when osama had left he got a bag and he personally left himself he went to tangiers uh he felt that he uh this is nor hamadi he felt that he was being used as a scapegoat his exact words were mr Simeonov and me had no issue i had no quarrel with him he was just a security man doing his job at the end of the day um so Nor Hamadi actually came back to the country and he was arrested at the end of the uh, year. Uh, yeah, end of the year, end of the month, sorry. Uh, but police kind of knew what was going on. They got all the information, but that what they needed to do was to find these people. As mentioned, uh, because all of them had acted together as a group, uh, therefore they were considered equally responsible for the death of uh, Tudor. Uh, so Adam... Uh, Khalili, Nor Hamadi, Harun, Akram, and as mentioned, uh, Osama Ham Hamad. Uh, they were the the main four kind of uh, responsible for this. Uh, even though it was uh, uh, Osama Hamad who was uh, directly responsible for inflicting the sta fatal stab wound which killed Mr. Simeonov because he was holding the knife. That's what was said at the Old Bailey. Um, Philip Evans QC prosecuting said at the time of the stabbing the knife which was used was not in the hand of any of these defendants before you. It was being held by a man named Osama Hamid. Osama Hamid was directly responsible for inflicting the fatal stab wound which killed Mr. Simeonov. He, however, cannot be tried in the course of this trial because he had fled the jurisdiction. So when the trial was happening, well, the initial trial was happening at Westminster, Westminster Co uh, Coroner's Court and then it went to the Old Bailey, he still hadn't come back by that point. He was still hiding away in another country. Uh, so they had to try the others first. Uh, they were tried with um the lesser charge of manslaughter which is what they said to uh violent assault gbh uh against the various uh bouncers who were there so uh, as mentioned uh so uh what else have we got so nor Hamadi was arrested as he attempted to re-enter the uk on board a flight at Gak gatwick airport on the 17th of february 2019 so he'd fled for about six to seven weeks uh adam uh, khalili had uh also traveled to morocco uh and he too was arrested on his way back uh but uh when the police got to his home address uh on the 29th of january um he had 
unsuccessfully attempted to evade arrest by jumping out of a window. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, let's see what else. Uh, the police uh, investigation was relatively simple. Uh, there's Forensics were on the scene relatively early. Uh, as you can appreciate, it's a high traffic area, so there's be a lot of fingerprints there, but there was a lot of kind of... Uh, a lot of visual witnesses they also had mobile find fa- mobile phone footage um they got two pieces of footage um but they were still appealing for witnesses to come forward because when they were looking at the one piece of footage they got they were able to see that there was quite a few people with cameras as well but a lot of these people didn't come forward and it's hard to point out who these people were it's amazing that people would have this kind of information but they wouldn't come forward and yet they would happily upload it online so they can get likes uh what else we got um as mentioned yet there were no this was the problem with the cases that there were no the knives were never found so even though the bin men had turned up and you kind of know where the bin men are therefore if you go to the the tip you know where afterwards you'll be able to find kind of any layer the problem is it's hundreds it's it's hundreds of feet wide the amount of junk and especially it's new year's eve so the bin men would have been working flat out clearing the streets of all the bottles and all the crap left by all the piss heads so uh yeah unfortunately the knife was never found which is a real problem and as mentioned in this episode as well you've got two pieces of video footage from mobile phone cameras one caught the early part of the attack from a different angle the second one which is nearer and is much clearer and you can see exactly who it is the footage cuts out just before the murder itself uh unfortunately it was never said whether the person who shot the footage had either switched it off deliberately or whether it was edited that way we don't know uh, but unfortunately, that wasn't used in court. The the footage was, but we were unable to. So unable to see uh, uh, Osama stabbing Tudor, which is absolutely vital for the uh, the footage. Uh, the police felt that they had irrefutable evidence, even though they hadn't got the video footage. But for, fortunately, um, that didn't make it uh, to trial. Uh, so therefore, it ended up not being a murder case. It ended up being a manslaughter case. Uh, his girlfriend um, Magdalena Angel I've put it down as but I've, there's two different versions of this it's either Angel or Angel uh, or, I, or Angel so I'll put an Angel um, uh, she said Tudor was only 33 years old and we'd planned our whole lives together and by losing him I have lost everything um, she said she was pleased that the two men had been convicted but we must now keep keep working to find osama hamad who remains on the run from the police this was after because of the first trial happened and then it was obviously a second trial when uh, osama hamad was caught uh she added imagine how you would feel knowing that one of those involved in the death of your loved one was still walking free um Ah, uh, she said we were meant to be getting married but instead of attending our wedding i've been attending court instead of going to church to arrange our wedding uh, i was going to ch- i was going to church to bury him my life has been turned upside down uh, da, da, da. Uh, she said uh, Tudor and I met three years ago at at university in Romania and in October 2018 we moved to London to start a new life Tudor was a professional rower and he had been successful in many competitions Um, he believed that moving to uh, England would be an opportunity to focus on his sport Uh, it's kind of ironic with this that he wasn't meant to be working that night and everyone kind of said you know he's a lovely guy even she says he just happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time he was simply unlucky Uh, what else Uh, I think that's it I think that's all the details that I didn't get to put in Uh, yeah uh as mentioned his body was repatriated back to romania and they had a big funeral for him there uh there's uh footage online of the funeral itself uh what else have we got should i do what well, uh, initial uh, committal hearing at westminster magistrates court on monday the 16th of march 2019 uh this was just the original one with uh nor hamada uh, adam khalili uh, Haroon Akram this was the one that um, Osama wasn't at 
All three appeared for sentencing later at the Old Bailey uh, via video link from Belmarsh Prison. Uh, just having a whiz through this. It's a little bit complicated as it goes through. It's kind of that they're, they're tried for so many. De- as you can appreciate, the kind of the uh, the prosecution are trying to put through as many charges as possible because they know that the defence are going to bat away as many as possible. So if you put in as many charges as you can, you know that some will disappear, and then you, hopefully you can get them charged with some some serious stuff, uh, which they did. Um, what else have we got? Uh, Osama Hamada was arrested at Gatwick Airport and he told officers he was not a murderer. He denied murder but admitted manslaughter and five counts of GBH with intent and violent disorder. Uh, he was uh, convicted of violent disorder and four wound- wounding charges but the jury failed to reach a verdict against him on a charge of murder. Hamada finally admitted to manslaughter uh, during the trial. Um, it was a difficult trial for the the, the jury. Uh, the jury had been discharged after failing to reach some verdicts in the trial of of uh, the killing. Um, oh, what else have we got? There was a, a secondary hearing uh, held at the Old Bailey on the twenty third of September. So that was the one that uh, Hamad was actually charged at. What else have we got? I think that's it. I think that's the lot. Uh, yeah, yeah. Don't really know much more about uh, Fast Eddie after that point. He's probably gone on to another scheme. Scheme. Get a job. Get a job, mate. Get a job. Come on. You're rich. You got money. You, you don't need to work for a living. Just, just, just enjoy your life and stop pretending that you, yeah, you've got great plans. Right, let's do uh, answers to the questions. <gasps> I don't think I messed up many. I don't think I did. That's a pretty, that's a miracle. Okay, what sport did Tudor do professionally? He was a rower. He was part of a four-man sculling crew. Uh, sculling crews are those really, really uh, sharp, razor-like boats, and everyone's kind of in an order, and they're very low down. You get them on the uh, the Oxford and Cambridge boat race, the world's most pointless sport. Uh, but it's on telly because everyone who worked in telly either went to Oxford or Cambridge. Whoop, you fucking do. Uh, but it's a four-man crew. I think he's. I think he used to do two-man crews as well. Um, question number two: What was the name of Fast Eddie's first project? It was the Gate Crasher, Gate Crasher Balls, <laughs> which was uh, the. Uh, it, it, it sounds like paedophilia, to be honest. It was, it, it was the the. Uh, it was the thing where he said like, uh, it's for posh kids of rich parents, you know, and it's for uh, Lolitas and Lotharios to turn up t- twats, basically. Um, question three: Which Romanian city did Tudor and his fian- fiance fly from? I did it again. It was Bucharest. Question four. What was in the pond at the party at 33 Portland Place? It was a thousand litres of cognac. What a waste. What a waste. Why not just just fill it full of water, colour it and add some booze flavouring? Who's going to drink out of a pond? Honestly, Uh, the other uh, uh, extra question I put in there was 33 Portland Place. What was filmed there? Um, And this was used in the King's speech as Lionel Logue's surgery. Uh, I think it's being re-renovated as something kind of posh at the moment. Uh, But uh, apparently uh, it has also been used as a location for a gay porn film called The King's Peach. There you go. You can treat yourself. Uh, Question five. How much does it cost to rent 80 Park Lane per month? That's £16,000. £16,000 a month. Waste of money. Uh, Question six. What time did the party start and what time was it meant to finish? Uh, 2 a.m. and 6 a.m. What was the make of petrol station next door to 80 Park Lane? It's an SO garage. It's still there today. It looks really weird because you have all these posh uh, car showrooms and posh hotels. And then in the middle of it, you have an, an SO garage and a Londis. And you just go, 
Okay, that's weird. Um, question eight. What was smashed inside the hallway by one of the group? It was a vase. Question nine. What was Fast Eddie holding during the when the attack happened? Uh, it was a credit card machine. And ten. What type of car did Atu, the doorman, throw one of the gang over? It was a grey Lamborghini. <sighs> that's that. That's good. Well done, Michael. You got this done early, which means I can spend the next two days editing. Lovely. Tired. Good. That's that done. Uh, hope you enjoyed that episode. <laughs> Hopefully, iTunes won't be a massive idiot this time and won't balls up this episode and mean that people can't get to listen to it sorry if that kind of affected you uh i did i always push to try and get the i always get the episodes out early and edited early and make sure they get out and i you know uh, and i always make sure you get an episode even when i'm not going to be able to do an episode but it's so which is why it's really annoying when itunes come along and go meh algorithm says no oh bastards anyway that's that Hope you're all well, hope you're all safe and happy, and I will speak to you all soon. Stay safe, be good, lots of love.